Hello everyone. Welcome to another thought-provoking sub-session of the Commonwealth Action Series. Today's session is a part of theme number four, which is youth development, inclusive, equitable, and accessible opportunities. This session is partnered by Enable Lanka Foundation, Global Shapers Colombo Hub in tandem with the Shaping Disability Summit and the Commonwealth Children and Youth Disability Network. Today's session is Everyone Needs a More Inclusive World. My name is Crystal Reed Vijay Surya, co-founder of Enable Lanka Foundation, a youth organization working to dignify and reframe the values of persons with disabilities in Sri Lanka. And I'll be moderating today's discourse. I am joined with some amazing trailblazers and youth leaders of our time. And let me introduce the speakers for you today. First, we have Arjun Mishra. He is a co-founder of Nabet India, an organization work, working for the employment and empowerment of persons with disabilities. He identifies opportunities to seamlessly integrate persons with disabilities into the workforce and has consulted the government participation in strategy to make it more advantageous for the community. We, are, we also have Jackie Waimaro from Kenya, a young woman living with a disability who champions and advocates for inclusion of persons with disabilities and sexual and reproductive health rights in Kenya. She's a teacher by profession. Then we have Ken Chua. He is the founder and director of These Abilities from Singapore. He's a member of the Global Shapers Network and a fellow change maker at Change. Ken is a strong advocate of design for all and works on universal designs and assistive technologies, which helps persons with disabilities. Then we have Rosemary Ramit. She has been involved in a number of disability advocacy campaigns and empowerment programs in Diana. She's a trained teacher working in special education needs with a focus on blind education. Rosemary also represented Diana and the West Indies in the first ever West Indies blind cricket team for women. What an absolutely bright and competent panel we have got here today. And before we move into the panel discussion, there are a few ground rules and some information I would like to share with the audience. So this session will be recorded and shared on our social media platforms. And I request all participants to keep their audios on mute when someone is speaking because it's not supposed to be disturbing and you know, we, we have to work on this tech issue sometimes. Uh, also, please feel free to keep your video switched on at any time. There will be a QA and a session where you can type out any question to our panelists uh, on the chat box. Or if you have any questions during the Q&A session, you can obviously raise your voice, you know, and um, you know, ask any questions from our panelists. And last but not least, let's try to be actively engaging in this conversation because it's a very important and timely topic that we are discussing here today. So without further ado, can I first turn to Ken? Ken, yes, hi Ken. Hope you're doing well today. And I know time is a little bit late for you, so I'll just start off with you first. So Ken, my question to you, you come from a developed country and your views and experience on disability inclusion may be different uh, or your aspects could be different to some of us coming from rather developing nations. Uh, could you maybe share your journey and what made you a uh, part of equity and inclusion of persons with disabilities and the work line that you've chosen right now? Sure. Um, so first of all, thanks for having me. And um, I guess to your point, um, coming from Singapore, which is a relatively developed country, um, I guess the observations that I've made is that, um, for example, in the disability space, you realize a lot of founders of disability focused social enterprises are not actually disabled themselves. Um, and, and you start to wonder why that might be the case, right? And, and uh, upon much reflection, I think it's also because um, as a developed country, um, we have to a certain extent, the privilege of having solved very large critical issues um, early on in the growth of our nation. For example, you know, clean water, sanitation, electricity, 
you know, stable electricity and stuff like that. Whereas when you speak to other governments in more developing countries, that is top of mind for them and not so much disability. Um, so um, having spoken to some policymakers in, in some of the developing nations as well, they do see disability as something that is a bit far reaching for them at the moment. Um, and then they do look to Singapore because we can now put our heads together uh, towards disability and, and, and working out solutions in, on, on that front. Um, due to that also, as a developed country, what, inevitab what inevitably happens is that because you have so much more resource and support, that um, there, there comes a tipping point where um, the disability community um, also starts to choose between do they want to actually power through and innovate solutions on their own or do they want to rely on well-resourced people when it comes to, to you know, financial means as well as you know, other um, know-how to build solutions for them, right? And that becomes uh, an easy way out. And, and what we do realize is in Singapore, for example, um, it's come to a point where the definition of problem solving sometimes is writing letters to ministers rather than actually building solutions on their own. So that's something that um, I've seen happen and you know, definitely we're still trying to ensure that as we go about our work, we are definitely working with the community um, so that we transfer the knowledge um, and skills that they can take back to their community and, and empower within the community as well. So, yeah. Thank you, Ken, for your thoughts. Uh, with that, I move to Rosemary. Hi, Rosemary. Are you there with us? Hi, hello. Thank you so much for having me. Hi. It's so lovely to have you here with us today. Uh, Rosemary, to start off with, as a young girl growing up uh, with a disability, could you share a glimpse of your journey with us? Because it's not easy or, you know, it's a rather difficult journey, especially when you're a woman living with a disability in a community. Uh, what are your lessons from this journey? And then how have you kind of overcome the battles that have come across your life? All right. Uh, well, first of all, uh, before the age of 13, I had no disability. So I was a typical child. I was attending mainstream school. You know, I was in secondary school. And then 13 plus, I was diagnosed with panuveitis, which is my eye condition. And um, because of that, I was not aware of any services that were available for me. And then at that time, we did not have as many services that we have um, now available then. And um, the school was not prepared or did not have the knowledge on how to handle a situation where you have a student with a disability. So I was forced to drop out of school until the age of 17 when I resumed my studies. But um, for me, the problem was that I did not know of any services that were available and I did not have any opportunities until around age 17. And so what I have learned um, from, from those experiences is that we, we need opportunities. And not only do we need opportunities, but we need these opportunities to be readily accessible in terms of the information so that anyone who has newly acquired a disability can have that opportunity to seek any assistance that they may need. Um, with regards to me being a female, of course, um, the idea was that um, I would spend the rest of my life dependent upon my parents because I was a female and, you know, I couldn't go out and do things because um, my, my extended family didn't want anybody to take advantage of me and so on. Um, so that all changed when I, I finally went out and I got involved in the disabled community. And, um, you know, I acquired an education and then I became an advocate for persons with disabilities. And so it was really about proving that I had the capacity and the ability to do things. And I think that was what helped me through along with support from the organizations of which I'm a part. Right. Thank you so much for that, Rosemary. I mean, indeed, I agree with a lot of points you highlighted. We too come from a developing country and we see many young girls with disabilities who are further deprived by education, employment, 
and even their rights as uh, children and even as women. So thank you for those thoughts. With that, I think I'd move to Jackie. Uh, Jackie, you're a, a sexual and reproductive health rights champion in your community. And this is such a vital, yet a taboo or stigmatized topic in many African and Asian countries. Uh, also, it's not just about young girls, but it's also about young boys with disabilities who are once again uh, an afterthought of a topic when it's come for sexual and reproductive health because we fail to identify them as you know sexually activated human beings as well. So, what are your thoughts around this? What made you, uh, you know, become a SRHR champion? What drives you every day? Okay, hi Christoph. Hi everyone. Thank you for this opportunity, and I hope that you are getting me. Actually, over here it's raining very heavily, and I hope my voice is clear. Okay, um, yeah, I'm a sexual health uh, rights representative, and uh, sorry for that. There are a lot of challenges that we, as persons with disability, experience here in Kenya. The first one being unfriendly recipients. Like, I have a disability, I go to the hospitals, and the first thing I get is a very judgmental look. Like, the service providers are like, so you also participate in sexual activities. They don't, like, most people don't understand that persons with disabilities are people with needs, emotional and sexual needs. And that is a very, bad thing and challenging thing to, to most of us persons with disability. Another thing is the society. Uh, we tend to have a very judgmental society, mostly in Africa. And uh, being a developing world, most people are backward. Let me use that word for lack of a better word. They are backward in terms of uh, sexual, sexual stuff. Like a uh, long time ago in Africa, sex, sex was a sacred thing and it was not talked about openly but nowadays we tend to talk about it and when you talk about it people are very judgmental and they start saying that you are talking things that are taboo so i believe that with so much civic education and um, talking more about us as persons with disability with needs and emotions sexually uh, change will, will happen in africa Another thing is access to contraceptives. Contracept yeah, that's a challenge too, because uh, most people when trying to access this, personally me being one of them, when I try to access these contraceptives, uh, the same thing happens, I'm judged. And uh, myself, I'm tiny, I'm small bodied. So first of all, they take me as a child and first they have like to ask for your identity card, check your age and all that. And that's very diminishing and discriminative. So I hope this changes and uh, we achieve a better society. The last thing is um, unfriendly environment, mostly when it comes to accessibility. A person using a wheelchair will not be able to access these buildings and the hospitals because there are no ramps, there are no lifts. They are just, they are just stairs. And uh, remember, I'm using crutches or wheelchair. And uh, this makes it hard for me or for other persons with disability to access these rights. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jackie, for your thoughts around it. Uh, I think it definitely uh, speaks in volume when it's come for sexual and reproductive health rights, especially in our countries as well. Uh, when it's come for access to it. I mean, it's just regardless of a disability, it's a taboo topic. And then having a disability would only make that barrier even more difficult and um, make you feel stigmatized by it furthermore. With that, uh, Arjun, I move to you. Arjun, I think I make you, uh, I make you for the first time last year and we've had very interesting conversations around the work you do. Because I'm your passionate young individual and your thoughts are mostly around making people with disabilities more economically independent and to ensure that their participation in the labor market is uh, secured in some way. Uh, Arjun, why don't you just share a few thoughts around how you joined this journey, why it happened, and 
what how has the journey been so far for you sure um chris thank you so much for having me here and uh, it's such a pleasure being in the midst of um, so many known faces i see ken here it's a pleasure being in the midst of you all as always um the journey of mine started in 2011 and uh, as i had highlighted before it was a personal loss and it was some uh, it was a relative of mine who was um who had been for long affected due to her uncontrolled diabetes with vision loss and it was her struggle with her disability and eventually uh, the loss of her life that inspired or maybe motivated me to work towards solving the problem of this special you know this specific segment of the society uh, and i also saw the resonation that amongst all disabilities and that was the reason why i started with the visually impaired as the first ones uh, it was the visually impaired who were the least represented in the workforce so when i started this journey um, 2011 12 uh, about close to 10 years back what i noticed was that um, the biggest problem which was feel faced which I wanted to address, and that was around the economic empowerment in terms of their inclusion into the mainstream workforce. Uh, the mismatch which I saw was that eventually in terms of their employment versus their expectations from the uh, industry and also the training which has been available to them, uh, there's a lot of limitations around that. Uh, it's not updated, it's not to the, the industry requirements. And I saw a, a use case or a need which could be addressed by my organization, and that was in carrying out that specific training to various industry requirements so that post completion of this training, I can have maximum employment generated for the batch of students who have enrolled with NABIT. So I uh, got the industry participation into uh, designing the curriculum, designing the course, and also eventually implementing the program by um, employee participation so that eventually it would lead to maximum employment for uh, the participating students. Uh, flash forward uh, 10 years journey, uh, more than 1500 employment generated in India a happy place for me. Um, of course, the recognitions, those things are, uh, yes, it does help in the journey. It gives you the encouragement, but eventually it's the smiles which we deliver each day to the, to the lives um, of the people we serve, which inspires the most and uh, most happy about it. Thank you so much, Arjun. I mean, definitely agree with you on it. Uh, the work you've done is quite amazing. And if the audience would like to connect with you in any way, uh, we'll be sharing uh, our panelist channels, also their social media pages for you to follow and connect with them. Uh, with that, uh, once again, uh, Ken, I would like to move to you. Uh, so, as I mentioned before, you're, an, you're a strong advocate on universal design. You believe in designing for everyone, and that's what you stand for. Why is it important, uh, as for your understanding and experience, for us to design for all? And, how do we implement these to support human diversity at a larger scale? Yeah, so I guess my background is as a product designer and an engineer. And I guess when I first chose to start this journey, um, I didn't choose to um, really abide by the medical model of disability, but rather the social model of disability. And, and because of that, you know, I focused way more on lifestyle changes um, and how we could redesign, you know, products, services, and environments that we interact with on a daily basis um, that would be more inclusive. So things like transportation, banking, um, you know, financial services, um, you know, um, food and beverage, stuff like that. And all of those decisions always boil down to how you design, right? And you know, with, with design thinking being all the rage, there is this part of the process where um, very early on, what happens is you will do all the data research that you can um, and try and summarize everyone in society into one optimized mythical individual and then you design for the individual. And that becomes a very scary proposition because um, what happens with that, uh, as is the case sometimes with universal design, is that you're designing for the average. And what happens when you design for the average is sometimes you end up not designing for anyone at all, right? Because the average is just uh, a mixture of everyone, but it's, it's no one person in particular. And, and so, um, you know, with universal design, it is it falls under the category of um, different types of disability design. 
And mainly I would, you know, want to put out the differences between um, two of them. So universal design and inclusive design, um, of which inclusive design is the one that I, I advocate more strongly uh, these days. So um, <clears throat> universal design is the, the main, uh, main form of disability design that has been around for the longest time. Um, and its history has been stamped in the built environment. Um, and with that, uh, there essentially is this concept of one size fits all. You build one thing that can fit everyone. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> that was true in the past because, you know, with the built environment, you're talking about large spaces. So if let's say when you're going about those design decisions, you realize that you've actually left out the consideration of certain groups of people, you have the space to accommodate them after the fact. Whereas in this day and age, when we're moving more digital, especially I think, um, you know, globally, what happens is we're working with smaller devices. We're, we're working with just one screen that we're looking at at a time. Um, and, you know, the decisions that we make have to be a little bit smarter um, and better. And so that's where inclusive design comes in where uh, it's what we call one size fits one instead of one size fits all. And that's really trying to have a more personalized fit uh, for each individual that celebrates their diversity and their differences. And I think why this is important is because um, I guess it's human nature that, you know, subconsciously, because of stereotypes and different visual labels, we kind of... Um, uh, have a us versus them mentality. Like if you see someone in a wheelchair, you'll be like, oh, you know, maybe I, I, I'm not in a wheelchair. So, you know, we're, we're different people. Um, but there are a lot of different invisible disabilities that are also around. And when you design for a diversity of needs and you can tell that story, that's how you bring to light that there are actually, you know, way more types of people than you can imagine. Um, uh, and that you've not interacted with yet. So, so that's one of the important roles of, of design as well. Uh, Ken, I think uh, I have a question for you on the designs that you are referring to, on the inclusive design. Are there any examples you could share with the audience? Because some of us might be already aware of it, but for some of us, you know, inclusive designs could be a fairly new kind of a topic or an aspect. Yeah, so... I'll give you one example of inclusive design. Um, and, and so just keep in mind that um, the philosophy of inclusive design is that when you design for the extreme use cases, you actually design for more. So there are actually a lot of different products and services and features that, we, that uh, people without disabilities uh, enjoy today that actually came about because it was you know, being used in research with people with disabilities. So for example, if you're gonna type on Google, um, you know, something, it's gonna try and guess the rest of your sentence, right? Autocomplete. And that was actually developed in the disability space first, um, mainly with people who have dex upper, upper limb um, dexterity um, challenges um, so that they could use the computer faster, right? And now it's something that we all enjoy um, just as a matter of speed and not so much a disability or not and stuff like that. So that's that's one example of inclusive design. Right. Thank you so much, Ken. I think definitely, um, honestly, I didn't know about that to be honest as well. So thank you for sharing that. There are a lot of things I think in the world today that we, we have been using, we have the luxury of using that we don't know that it's been designed uh, initially for persons with disabilities. So I guess this is something, once again, for us to think through um, and to see how within our communities we can make our designs, our infrastructure more accessible for all of us. And also one most important thing that we discuss is on the aging population today in the world. Uh, for, for one thing, countries like even Sri Lanka today, we are an aging population. So what we forget about is maybe it's not for the use of today, but it is for the use of tomorrow or in a few years' time. So that's definitely something we need to keep in mind. Uh, Rosemary, I now turn to you. I think earlier you, you know, briefly touched upon inclusive education, the struggle you had as a child and how you kind of overcame it. 
Now, with the post pandemic, once again, education has changed, it's evolving, and a lot of things initially that were not uh, granted, that were requested, I mean, Ministry of Education and also even employment, a lot of things are now slowly and, you know, we are slowly changing and we're moving towards a different style of education as well. How, how is it, how has things changed for you in your community post pandemic? If it's, if, or as for your knowledge, if it's not changed, what are some of the solutions that we can, you know, take within the community or as individuals to ensure there is more inclusive education, especially for our children? Because this pandemic, uh, I mean, I feel like it's here to stay and people keep on saying it is the new normal. I think it's no longer new. It has now embedded in the system and the society. So I would like to take a, you know, request your thoughts and suggestions around this. All right. Um, well, the first thing is that this pandemic has taught us the importance of technology and the importance of the use of technology. Now, prior to, to the pandemic, um, I think in the education sector, you know, it was known that technology definitely makes the life of persons with disability a whole lot easier. Um, but I don't think it was emphasized enough. And even in the classroom, um, teachers were not obligated per se to use technology. In fact, it was rarely used. And that could be for a variety of reasons, you know, lack of resources, lack of knowledge and how to use certain um, assistive technologies and so on. Um, so, so in the pandemic now, what has happened is that we see where we have virtual learning, you know, we have all these online classrooms. And um, one, I think one of the, the good things that came from it was the fact that a lot of children who were having problems either with physical access to a classroom or those um, children with autism, for example, who you know do not function well in a social setting, um, they tend to be doing a lot better at home as you know, that challenge of being in a social setting or, or not having physical access to a classroom has been removed. So uh, post pandemic, you know, if um, hopefully things do return to some level of, of, of normality, but whenever that does happen, I do see um, the Ministry of Education, especially when it comes to special education, um, moving towards the utilization of ICT a lot more in the classrooms. And in that way, um, they can include a lot more children with disabilities because in Guyana here, we have 10 administrative regions. And um, with the exception of maybe three regions, seven of them are what we call rural areas. So those are where the indigenous people, peoples live. And because of that, you don't, they generally don't have access to quality education, those who are non-disabled, far less those who are disabled. And, um, you know, ICT or, or the, the provision of ICT and using it to teach can definitely bridge that gap that exists currently. Um, also, when it comes to, you know, long-term solutions, the Ministry of Education definitely has to revisit the curriculum and modify the curriculum in a way that would allow for the use of ICT more in the classroom and would require teachers to use ICT a lot more in the classroom. So again, this doesn't only make the work easier for the, for the students who have disabilities, but it also helps to bridge that gap so children could be at home and still be learning. They don't necessarily have to be in school for those who are not able to physically access the school. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I think I think that's a definitely interesting conversation that uh, we've all been having about ICT and making education more tech driven. But like you highlighted in many rural areas, once again, this becomes a issue because it's not just about providing them the network, I think. It's also about giving them 
the support that's required after the intervention. Yeah, definitely, yeah. definitely, definitely. Yeah. We would need a holistic approach, you know, because for many years we've been doing things piecemeal. You know, we do a small thing here, there's a small thing done there, and there's nothing that's that's holistically done. So definitely, you know, it wouldn't only include giving these children devices or or you know having them get access to proper internet but also you know setting up support in these in these various regions where these children would be able to get the kind of support they need to be able to effectively function in school yes so uh, in Diana, is it something that you've been you know exploring around or have you already taken the steps through the ministry um, just to understand definitely definitely we are in you know i think we're moving a lot faster now you know because um we we have our newly found oil and there's so much development that's going on and so you know the government is a lot more receptive to to our advocacy and i definitely do see you know progress being made when it comes to special education because currently we have a policy but the policy has never um have never have has never been realized sorry and it's currently being reviewed you know so we are definitely working on making recommendations for that policy whenever they do decide to to realize it that sounds very interesting maybe this is something we all could connect with you and then kind of explore to see what we can bring from your experiences from your country and to see if we can localize it here in our countries as well uh definitely. so yeah that would be great. So, um, Arjun, I'm now turning to you once again. Uh, Arjun, I think uh, disability is uh, more common than we all think. Yet, we are still struggling to make more reasonable accommodations when it comes to our work environment. Once again, in the post pandemic, uh, we've seen, as I mentioned earlier, how um, requests that were made are suddenly made available overnight. But, but then again, you know, most regulations and the policies and the practices are not supporting a non-disabled, uh, are only supporting a non-disabled workspace. So how do you suggest we tackle this? Because I know you have been doing a lot of, you know, consulting work with the government and, you know, the organizations, the corporate sector. What are those immediate actions we can take and what are the longer term in your as for your knowledge, we can take to ensure that there's more inclusive employment in our community. Okay. Um, answering that, Chris, uh, what I believe is um, uh, something uh, around the point that we need to off we need to find an answer where uh, it creates benefits um, for the employers first. Uh, socialism in its truest form. Uh, it's theoretical, but something which cannot be uh, practically, you know, implemented, especially in countries like ours, which are the developing nations. And I think the answer to that is not only for the developing nations, may that be for the developed ones also. If you create value and if you solve a problem for a partnering company, um, they will go foot over board to try and accommodate resources as far as possible. And COVID or non-COVID is not anyways, uh, you know, an, uh, a disruptor of sorts. What I have seen was, you know, for, for many years, you know, even before I came into this profession, what I saw was for many years, people used to complain that, you know, the employers aren't receptive to the, or the corporate sector is not receptive to the needs um, of the people with disabilities. And they don't see, they do not participate or they do not want, you know, disability inclusions in the workplace. And I was also, you know, a believer of this till I actually started working with them myself. And what I understood was, it's never a problem of their being non-receptive. What they have an issue with is that if the resources that you're providing do not add value or do not solve a problem for them, then it does not make sense for them as a profit uh, motived or motivated entity to spend behind a particular set of people. So you first need to create a value or solve a problem from them, get your resources trained to the expectations of these companies. After you have created a need, then the all the things which we ask about you know reasonable accommodations and everything else it will follow and it does happen so i can quote companies um, who i have been working with which have made more than enough accommodations in their workplace but prior to that they had to be proven to the point that actually uh, what we are suggesting is not only 
theoretical that actually can be implemented a and b what is it for them in terms of them having to solve the problem of attrition in order for them to be having a, a dedicated workforce and in order for them to have the same performance metrics which they are expecting from a non disabled resource from the identified beneficiaries who we are giving them to work with if you can solve these three or four issues which will drive value for them i can promise this it's not only for the indian context across the world anywhere they will make all accommodations possible to have maximum inclusion if you can't solve it then vice versa is also absolutely true so you need to have a, a value proposition and if you can create that all companies will come chasing you you won't need to do the other way around and that's the solution yeah definitely arjun i mean thank you for sharing that and then that is ultimately the hard truth that we need to kind of digest somehow uh, in our system uh, arjun would you like to share a success story of uh, such uh, you know initiative that has been taken by the companies that you work with if that is okay with you of course i can as recently i can share about you know um, uh, there's a company which we started working with uh, it's one of the biggest um, conglomerate um across india and i think has a, a, a outside india presence too it's called the mahindra group and uh, uh when i joined when i started working for them i was under the impression they must have done lots and lots already in the space of disability and what added extra will i be able to offer to them and i was surprised with the answer that this is going to be the starting point with disability empowerment that we'll be starting and nabit will be the first ones to answer a solution for them so i even went ahead and asked that what was your participation participation theory prior to what uh, i came to offer in terms of providing an inclusive workplace in order to provide manpower which will be trained to your expectation they said we used to write donation checks that's all that we used to do we used to identify ngos write them a donation check and that's about it so i said then what are you doing now and they said that what you are offering to us is something which is going to be the universal truth very soon and it's something which will be very easy for us to sell to our board because eventually you're talking about something which will benefit us and which business in its sane mind will not want a better workforce and which business in their sane mind will not want better productivity and that's the reason why we came and, and that's the reason why they have been committed to us for close to 10 years now they started with just one business of theirs which was a farm equipment fund which was in swaraj we presently working across four other business units of theirs which is into real estate which is into retail which is into uh something which we call mahindra trucks which is the logistic business so it all started with one entity participating with us and this is not something which can be done only in india every other country in every other space you can have a replication of this concept oh, that that's wonderful thank you for sharing that arjun uh, i think i think if uh, we all can even you know connect with you post this conversation to see once again like as told rosemary how do we create such best practices and ensure those can be implemented even in our communities at least start with small businesses to see you know it's 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 a, it's a trial and error for many organizations i must say but we need to start somewhere um so yeah i'm sorry i'm interrupting i'm sorry yeah. and interrupting but it should yeah. be the other way around go across to the big businesses and quote their example <laughs> to reach out to small businesses yeah let's hope we can do that one day then <laughs> thank sure. you uh right jackie yes i am now going to move to you i think earlier you uh, interestingly spoke about the visible and the invisible disabilities and the diversity the complexities within the disability as a spectrum and uh, when we talk about disability inclusion we also have to talk about the intersectionality of things because you work i mean you are a srhr champion and predominantly this you know works around women uh, girls and women when we talk about girls and women we definitely we cannot leave out women and girls with disabilities so we need to whenever these conversations comes up we need to address it as holistically and not just once again a part of it based on your experiences uh, why have we failed in addressing these key points why what, what are the suggestions that you have what are the solutions or you may propose to address these things how do we bring this how do we talk more about this intersectionality the diversities of disabilities when it comes to these everyday topics like women women's rights or lgbtiq rights or even any other conversation that we have around employment to education to uh, political participation could be anything but again we need to understand these are all you know cross cutting each other 
and disability is one portion that we really need to talk about. So what are your thoughts on it? And what are you doing in your community that you could share with us right now? Oh, okay, thank you. Okay, for me, the term disability is, on, is not an ability. It's a very cliche statement, which is often many people uh, use and, and it seems so much positive. Uh, but uh, in boardrooms and in private PW, PWDs, persons with disabilities issues are often ignored. Uh, failure to this, I will classify them into two. First is cultural. Uh, whereby we believe that all persons with disabilities are needy and inferior. Uh, another thing is that if you have a disability, God is punishing you through or punishing the parents for their previous sins or sins and uh, superstitions and witchcraft. You know that witchcraft is highly praised in Africa. So, so many people are superstitious and very they are just they just believe in witchcraft and when one when they see a person with disability they believe that this person is either witchcraft or maybe god is punishing his or her parents uh, second i'll classify it as religion many religious leaders uh, have gotten famous by promising to heal a pwd a person with disability to normal mood like uh, they see that when you have a disability, that's a sin. You are not supposed to be so. You are not supposed to have a disability. They have, they have, uh, they have segregated us because uh, by saying that we are going to heal you so that you can become normal like the others. And that I believe it's very wrong for such because uh, Africans are notorious, notoriously religious people and they follow what their pastors tell them. And I believe that if pastors could so stop using such words, they could uh, acquire inclusion and include persons with disability instead of now uh, praising and gospeling that uh, disability is a sin and you can be healed from it. Uh, use of some derogatory terms like uh, disabled. For me, I believe that we're not supposed to use that. We are all equal and uh, we have equal rights and we are just normal people. It's just that uh, some part of our bodies are just not functioning as they are supposed to. And also sometimes like uh, you are a child of God, God can heal you and all that. Uh, they, they make PWDs to become, to have, uh, to have low self-esteem and all that. Uh, so I believe that cultural and religious beliefs are, are high. They, 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 they bring a very high, uh, sorry, let me, so I believe that pastors and cultural beliefs and religious beliefs make disability seem like a very bad thing. So solutions to this, uh, like in Africa, we have so many beggars, mostly in Kenya. We have so many persons with disability who are begging on the streets. I believe we should stop this so that we can uh, stop the inferior, inferior, inferiority complex most PWDs have. So I, I believe that Begging in the street should become should be criminalized, should become a criminal uh, criminal offense, and should be legal should not be legal. Another thing, I believe that we should have equal opportunities for all persons with disabilities and all the able persons. And uh, if persons with disability are there, they should be given uh, governmental ministerial positions so that can, they can lead these positions. Like uh, in Kenya, the highest serving uh, principal secretary is uh, a one lady. She's under the Ministry of uh, Cultural Heritage and she's the highest serving person with disability in Kenya. I believe we need more inclusion, mostly in the political seats and the governmental ministerial so that they can air out our challenges and we can get inclusion. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Jackie. Um, a question for you on uh, what you discussed earlier about bringing more political participation and representation and breaking those barriers for persons with disabilities in your community. Are there any specific projects you are involved in or is, is there something that you are trying to implement over the next few years, uh, which you would like to share with the audience today? Pardon, 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 pardon. Sorry. 
Shall I repeat myself? Can you yeah, hear yeah, me now? Yeah. Yes. So what I was asking, uh, you mentioned about the political participation and ensuring there's more access to them and uh, more representation for persons with disabilities in your community. Are there any projects that or initiatives that you've already taken up or organizations that you know that have taken up? Or are there any projects that you are looking forward to in the next few years to implement in your community to ensure that there is more representation? Is there anything you would like to share with the audience? Um, right now, sorry, okay. Uh, about right now, I have not, okay, in Kenya, they're introducing a new constitution. It's called the BBI, Breaking, uh, Breaking Bridges Initiative. And uh, most of us persons with disabilities are against this because it's not on our side. There is no persons with disability representative in it. And uh, this has made us as persons with disability go against this uh, so that we can achieve inclusion. So, but we have very few representatives when it comes to the uh, gov government. We have very few that people with disability that are representing us there. Uh, maybe we have like 10 of them in the government and that's not quite, that's a very, uh, that's quite a small number uh, compared to the number of people with disability that are there in Kenya. Thank you, thank you so much, Jackie. I think uh, even right now here in Sri Lanka, we are going in for a constitutional reform and the community have actually come together to see how do we make those reforms that would make the reasonable accommodation for persons with disabilities in our country as well. So it's uh, good to hear that the same is happening in Kenya and I wish you all the best uh, for that endeavor as well. And also what you mentioned earlier about uh, looking at persons with disabilities as a more sympathetic thing or rather demonic thing. These are things that are actually happening right now as we speak as well. I think another point to add to it would be looking at a disability on a medical angle because we feel like we need to cure it rather than making the right accommodations. So I hear you loud and clear, and this is something we are all experiencing it. And uh, let's see how we as a community can change it through the Commonwealth Network that we have established. Uh, Ken, with that, uh, I have a question for you, Ken, on ableism, because this once again is a topic that we talk in our community about the everyday ableism um, and you know how it impacts persons with disabilities. But once again, for some of our audience, this could be a new concept. What are your thoughts around everyday ableism and how can we really you know, answer this or how can we tackle this issue around ableism in our community? Yeah, so I, I think based on the last point that was mentioned and, and Jackie, I think what you were sharing as well, <clears throat> Every country has a different, or I wouldn't even say country, but community um, in society may have varying levels of maturity in how they view inclusion. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I talk about this uh, quite a fair bit with my friend Haben Germa, who is uh, the first deafblind um, Harvard Law School graduate. And uh, it's, it's really that, you know, even, even though Singapore is such a developed country, we are so, so immature when it comes to um, inclusion, right? And what the concept of that is. And <clears throat> when that happens, and I'll use the example of Singapore again, is that, <clears throat> you know, inherently people are not evil or mean. They do want to try and contribute and, and partner with you and help, but because, you know, they don't um, empathize enough then that's where they don't understand the disability community enough. And that's where you start to see instances of ableism. So how I like to see it is <clears throat> it, with any, with any um, um, I guess, underrepresented community, the, the wider society has four stages. You can start from apathy, where you don't really care at all, to sympathy, right, where there's a power dynamic there, um, to empathy where you're on the same level and the empowerment where really you're just supporting right from the bottom. And <clears throat> I would say that Singapore is still very much in the, in the sympathy phase and that's where a lot of ableism 
comes about, I would say, casual ableism. So um, one example of that is um, with what <clears throat> I guess we will call the solutionist mindset. So <clears throat> I think from, from my um, the, the, the first question that I was answering, um, we talked about how there are a lot of non-disabled people who are designing solutions for people with disabilities. And because they are designing for people with disabilities and not designing with them, they totally miss the point. Um, so um, I'll bring up this example of this thing called the sign language glove, right? Which is where you have electronics in this glove and a, and a deaf person wears it. And then as they sign, um, it translates into text that's printed out on a screen. Um, to designers, to engineers, uh, or anyone without a disability, they're like, it's a good solution, right? You're finding ways for deaf people and people who are not deaf to communicate. But what these people don't understand as, as solution builders is that there is a cultural element to it whereby by introducing this sign language glove, you're essentially telling the deaf community that you do not value or see the value of sign language, which is a very core component of deaf pride and identity. And that's why they will never wear it. Um, and, and what you will see, and, and I just did this little research today, just across like, you know, the first 10 pages of Google to see how many people have actually created sign language gloves. And over the last, I just six years alone, there are at least 20 other projects working on the same thing which will never be accepted by the deaf community um, from all over the world. You know, really every continent has at least one group that has, has tried to work on this sign language glove. And that's one example of evilism, right? Um, <clears throat> other examples you would have is, I think even in media, how they talk about disability, it's still very much that, you know, for people with disabilities to be successful, they must overcome their disability. You know, it's always despite the disability and not because of the disability. That's why they are being celebrated. Um, and, and that's where I think a lot of the work that I do um, and, and, you know, kind of overreaching to Arjun's point as well, is how do we prove that people with disabilities are not just recipients um, of help uh, from society, that we're not just, you know, beneficiaries, but we can be benefactors, we can contribute to society. And then that's where the perspective shift will come as well. And the power dynamics will be a little bit more level. So, so yeah. Thank you again. I mean, definitely uh, agree with you in everything that you've shared. And this is something we talk about as well here in Sri Lanka, especially when it's come for everyday ableism, we talk about, you know, theater or you know actors and this is something we have this debate on you know why can't, can't you hire someone with a disability to play the role instead of giving to someone who does not have so i think these little things kind of you know go to your head and it embeds that you you know start thinking in those lines so these are some of the little things that we can start even in our communities to create a more thought-provoking conversation and like you definitely shared all these examples, very valid and timely, and I'm sure it resonates with all our uh, sentiments right now. Um, Rosemary, I there with me? Yes, uh, Rosemary, you, I think with inclusive education, a word that always comes up is special education or special educators or teachers. For me personally, I feel like this is, further excluding our children because we use the term special because the minute you say that it becomes once again a different type of an entity or a community do you feel the same way on this or if you do like how do you think we can you know normalize it in the system bring it to the mainstream education without having to emphasize saying special education all right, first of all, I totally agree with you. And I think Jackie and Ken, to some extent, touched on this, you know, where we talk about language and how language influences our perception of disability. And um, I mean, special education is a term that has been in the pub public realm for a really, really long time. And, um, and again, I do agree that it does contribute or it does perpetuate that exclusion. And um, from, 
from public conversations around or surrounding disability. Now, for me, my opinion on this is that um, we need to, to look, and when I say we, I mean all stakeholders who are, who are involved in education for persons with disabilities, um, need to understand when they say integration, they need to, to, to really um, operationalize that concept of, of integration, what it means to them and to, to persons with disabilities. So for, for instance, in Guyana here, we have our special schools where students with disabilities would attend. And then you have the mainstream schools. So that in itself already creates segregation for, for our, our children. And um, at the school where I work, at the Unit for the Blind, we have started to integrate our students into the mainstream classrooms. And our role there is just to provide the support that the student would need to overcome any challenges or limitations they may have in the mainstream classroom. Right, so it's really looking at the concept of integration and what do we mean when we say integration. And so if you look at integration as something whereby we just need to pack our, all our, our children with disabilities into a school and say, well, we're already providing them with education, so, so that's all fine. Or do we try to integrate them into the mainstream school? And so to, to a larger extent, you're, they're being integrated into, into the mainstream society. Um, some solutions to that. Now, the first thing in Guyana here that we need to start doing is to start training our teachers um, in, in the area of, I don't want to say the word, but want to a better term, special education, we need to start training our teachers in those areas because as it is currently, there are no areas of specialization in terms of disability. So if I want, I cannot go and study blind education or deaf education. I have to attend, you know, the, I have to choose a program that is already existing. And so I'm placed into a situation now where I'm working with students with disabilities and really I'm just dealing with them and, and, and working with them because of my experiences. You know, I, I really have no um, area of specialization or qualification that I could call upon to, to work with these children. And that, that's something that has been happening in our education system. A lot of people go into, into the specials. Um, they're untrained. They want to to quote unquote work with children with disabilities and it's more like a patronizing a patronizing thing that they do you know oh we're here to help these poor children out and, and like that's the whole idea and perception that we have here in Guyana when it comes to disability so it definitely has to do with remodeling and reforming the way we view disability and the way we view education for persons with disabilities. And of course, it, this would have to occur in the form of legislations. As I mentioned before, you know, we have our SEN policy, but of course, it's still in, 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 its, um, in, its, in its infancy stage. And in that, we need to really address how it is we plan to integrate our children into the mainstream education system so that you don't have this level of segregation when it comes to delivering education to these children. Yeah, no, th that's very true. I mean, again, it's the same story here. We always say we need are you in saying special education, we have special education teachers. So it's, it, it's I don't, like you said, I don't know whether we can remove it completely because it also, because once you remove it, the problem we might have it is that it might not get the priority that is at least being given now. So these are some right. of those key things. Right, there, there definitely, yeah, sorry for um, cutting you, That's but fine. yeah, there definitely has to be a conversation, you know, with all stakeholders to kind of see where it is we are now and where we want to go, where we want to be as a community of persons with disabilities. How do we want to be viewed? How do we want to be, to be spoken of? Like, you know, these are all, challenges and issues that we have to deal with in order to move forward when it comes to education for persons with disabilities. Sure. So with the trainers uh, back in Diana, uh, Rosemary, 
the, the curriculum or the training that is being given to the teachers. So when it's not for teaching children with disabilities, I'm, I'm assuming that training is done uh, separately to other teachers or is it an integral, I mean, sorry, an integrated part of the mainstream education? How does it work? Uh, could you please repeat that question? On, on the uh, training that has been provided to teachers, mm -hmm. when, you, when you talk about, you know, uh, special education, like we are discussing now, is it a part of your mainstream uh, tr uh, educational training? Or is it a completely different portion that you have to sign up for and uh, you know go through the training for? Or is it given as a part of your everyday training program? Right, so it's a part of the mainstream curriculum, but it's only one course, one single course that you do, right? So the two years or the three years that you spent there doing your associate's degree in education, you only do one course and it's a general introductory course to special education. So there are really no opportunities if one individual wants to specialize in a specific area, there are no opportunities to do that. Right, yes, I, I think uh, maybe that's something we could think uh, about. How do we make it much more significant and package it in a way that it, I mean, it creates more, to, to ensure it creates more value and show that there is more return on this investment. That's something we can uh, discuss. Uh, talking about return on investment, Arjun, I think once again, this was something earlier that you mentioned, how to ensure our corporate sector feels that there is a good return out of the investment they're making, especially making on these reasonable accommodation, right? Uh, with that, uh, as per your experience and understanding, what are the most immediate uh, and then in the longer term, what are the plans a country or a smaller community could adapt? In creating these accessible employment, uh, uh, accessible employments, because I know you shared one of your success stories, but it would be good if you could share a little bit more on how you went about it, what were the challenge, and how you overcame it. Maybe a few examples even, so that we can see how to kind of replicate a similar model in our communities as well. Okay, um, so a favorite model of mine, I'm just you know, a hypothetical model, which I felt has worked perfectly. Um, and uh, that should have been the starting point for any country which is serious and which actually wants to see a more empowered disabled community. And then I'll come back to my approach, which I'm proposed, uh, which, which I adopted. Okay. So if you guys have heard about what happened in the US, uh, so the government over there was, uh, I don't say compassionate because that's the wrong word was serious about um, inclusion for the disabled. And they understood that the corporate sector may take time to understand the value which, which is driven by inclusion. And so what they did was, rather than writing grants to NGOs, they started including them as vendors to, pro to government procurement. And so what happened as they were included as, um, as vendors to the government procurement programs, eventually, there was a lot of uh, skill which were which were included amongst the beneficiaries, and then from there on, the idea was not that we um, uh, we, we are we are assured of that procurement orders because there was competitiveness amongst various NGOs even within the, the segment of the pie which was which was dedicated to be procured amongst the NGOs, and what that competitiveness led to was specializations amongst specific NGOs to be managing specific procurement orders. So while you could have an NGO which was uh, maybe manufacturing fire hoses only, but the scale at which they operated and the quality of the product was you know, something which could not be competed by any other NGO within that segment. And that specialization also created huge number of employment. When the private sector saw that there's already an infrastructure in place, they have the skills, they have the resources, they have the beneficiaries would be employed, is when the government, apart from just the government, the private sector also started stepping in. And eventually NGOs there are working on a model in which they, yes, they're giving back to the society and creating more em empowerment. Added to that, what they're doing more importantly is that they have also created a separate revenue pool, which is from, uh, apart from the grants and donations, it's from the work which they are performing for the private and government sector. And that reduces the dependence on grants and donations. Now that I see as a perfect model, which any co country across the world serious about 
disabled employment should should follow and you already have a ready guide in place now talking specifically about my approach unfortunately i am in a country where the government is not very reciprocative uh, you know responsive and reciprocative and uh, the government follows the the corporate set in our country you have to first create a case uh, for them where uh, there already is a set of products and services which you have been uh, you have created and where you can create scale and you have to show significant success from the model that you have and the and the company which you serve have to endorse the quality of your product or service and there on after a huge layers of red tapeism bureaucracy and all the things along the way is when you can dream or think about getting into government procurements so had i had that advantage maybe the scale at which we could have grown um, and what could have happened i think that would have been a way better uh, space if i could have been in that kind of a scenario yes it comes with its own set of problems what has happened now is the specific ngos which are you know eating into the lion's share of the procurement and politics around it and yes there are many issues along this would come along but that would be a great starting point and that would create a uh, massive empowerment initiatives because uh ngos would become ngos would come to understand that here you have a separate pool which which is independent of grants and which needs to be taken as seriously as uh, the other segment and that's where it will be in their benefit to ensure that the skills which they are providing to their resources are exactly uh, to the industry standards and what the market demands so you first create an value and then you know follow that thank you arjun uh, arjun just to understand uh, the landscape of uh, you know employment in india uh, are there any special tax benefits given by the government to companies that are hiring people who have disabilities or making recommendations um so for three years there are uh, the the component of the um, provident fund which is basically a uh, a fund which i think is similar to what's been implemented in other cases for 3 years if you hire a person with disability the government bears that particular uh, component uh, beyond 3 years it's on the corporates to carry it forward but uh, honestly that's not a very big incentive uh, for a corporate to uh, take that step right okay thank you for those thoughts uh, jackie i'm moving to you with the final question for the day from my end uh jackie i think once again the topic uh, that you touched upon and the work that you are in with it's forever with the stigma and the discrimination as you mentioned earlier as well even when it comes to the gender equality what what are the what are more innovative solutions or things that you have been doing to tackle this because i know it's not easy to address these type of uh, issues or even talk about these things in your community how have you kind of you know found your way through it and get this information across to our younger generation okay thank you um number one civic education that's a major thing uh, it's high time we tell the society that we matter and we are better and we are important because most people don't know that and uh, also the only way we also are able to pass this information is through representation representation in the governmental positions uh and uh for myself I've done some researches and I've realized that most ministries that are led by persons with disabilities are good in terms of work ethics also when it comes to sports persons with disabilities should be aggressive so that to ensure ability and that disability does not matter also we should encourage integration learning this is where by as rosemary was saying that you have to put able children together with the special kids in one class and in kenya as uh, rosemary has said it's just the same as her country whereby we have special schools and uh, other schools but we have started the integration process in kenya but it is not it's it's yet it's it's far from being achieved so i i believe that integration should be also a key so that we can we can raise a generation that is disability friendly and they understand all the disabilities that we are facing another thing is 
following the constitution and amending it. Uh, in terms of, in Kenya, in terms of gender equality, we have the two that role, rule in the parliament, but it's yet to be achieved too, because we find that women are out there shouting and uh, demonstrating that our rights, we need to have our rights take up and uh, it's yet to be achieved. So we need the constitution to be amended and followed to the latter. Another thing is uh, the service providers like uh, teachers and uh, medical doctors. Uh, in Kenya, I'm a teacher myself. So in Kenya, if I go for teaching um, in college, I, I went I, when I went for teaching course, I never learned about sign language or Braille. That's, it, it's not included in the teaching career that I, I took. So if you want to be a sign language teacher or a teacher for special education, you have to go for a different course. I believe, I, for me, I think the service providers like teachers and medical doctors, because they, they are highly affected, they should learn special education in their courses and in colleges so that they can ensure inclusion when it comes to handling persons with disability and also children. Um, other thing is uh, um, equal opportunities and equal distribution of resources, such as employment opportunities to everyone. Persons with disabilities are highly left out in Kenya and they are dis discriminated for their looks or uh, by their looks. And the first question you are, uh, you ask by the person in charge is if you are capable of doing the work they are going to give you. So I believe that we should have an environment where there is creation of equal opportunities to all. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jackie. I think uh, again on the topic that we were discussing on HRHR and how do we create more visibility and discussions around it, uh, one of my most interesting learnings were when I met with uh, a young lady in India uh, called Aditi Gupta. So she has, she created a comic book which talks about menstruation and it was called Menstrupedia. Inspired by that, we locally developed a similar book here in our local languages where through a comic book we were trying to tackle various types of, uh, uh, you know, issues around menstruation, about pregnancy, and of course, we spoke about disability inclusion because these type of visual aid helps a lot, especially for the younger generation and for the children. And it makes it much more easier for them to understand the content than just, you know, putting it in a curriculum. So maybe this is something we too can explore as, uh, you know, in the Commonwealth, maybe, you know, discuss how do we bring a similar kind of a uh, project to your country to see whether that is applicable and can be made localized, then I would be you know, happy to discuss it with you. Uh, right, so with that, we concluded the moderated session. I want if there are any questions from the audience, please feel free to put it in, your, uh, put it in the chat box. So if you have any questions, you are now welcome to um, you know, direct them to our panel here. Yes, I think uh, Agnes, you raised your hand if you can unmute yourself. Yeah, my name is Agnes Wambilianga. I come from Kenya and uh, I deal in uh, solid waste management. That's my, I have a company that deals in solid waste management. And um, as, a, as a founder of this company, we've also like found it so, so difficult. We would wish that we include people with disabilities in our company, but Sometimes it's not like we are discriminating, but sometimes we find it so, so hard because the work that uh, we get involved with, it's like so much tedious and it needs a lot of energy, a lot of time and all that. So uh, I actually have another comment uh, to add on uh, what uh, uh, the panelists have said. I was, say, I was thinking like uh, all we have to do as a community we have to empower, we have like, if you have a child as a parent, you have a child with the disability, you have to empower them from the moment they are born that there's nothing wrong with them. So that when they grow up, they they can be 
inclusively accept themselves and they can always be included or access opportunities such as like in Kenya, in the county I come from, I thank God that uh, our county government has actually been offering tendering opportunities for people living with disabilities. There are certain tenders that are just meant for people with disabilities. So if we empower people with disabilities and they grow up empowered and know that there's nothing wrong with them, then they can take up such opportunities and they can take part in, in uh, building a community and knowing that there's nothing wrong with them. They don't have to be on the receiving end always. They can actually make a living out of such opportunities. Thank you. Thank you, Agnes, for sharing your thoughts around this. Uh, anyone else? I mean, it could be a question. It could be some interesting solution that you have that you've implemented in your community. Even the panelists are more than welcome to share your thoughts um, around this. If there is. Uh, please, can I say something? Yes, please. So, uh, thanks, Agnes, for that. Um, but I believe as, as a company, you can also hire one person or a person with a disability to be a supervisor. So it's not a must the person does manual work. You can hire them to be in the office and do like the office work. Other thing, I, I, I'll also like to add to a point whereby she has said that there are tenders out there for persons with disabilities in Kenya. Um, you find that in Kenya, most parents don't take their, their children living with disabilities to school they hide them and that's a bad thing. So you find that no, more, not so many persons with disabilities are educated. And when it comes to applying for job opportunities and such tenders, you find that they don't meet the qualifications required. So it's my cry out there to all parents to make sure that all children living with disabilities attend schools. Thank you. Thank you so much. Do we have any more questions? I can chip in to that discussion, maybe just real quick while others think of other questions. Um, yeah, I think definitely agree on really just finding a diversity of ways, right, for um, employment opportunities um, and ways to contribute, uh, in ways in which people with disabilities can contribute value. So um, I was building a um, inclusive maker space, meaning to say it was a space with machinery where you can actually build physical solutions to challenge access challenges. And part of it was getting people with disabilities to be part of that team, but some of them, you know, are severely paralyzed or, you know, have different forms of disabilities and they're like, oh, I can't do the manual labor. And Jackie, to your point, exactly, I said, you know, if you can't do things physically, there's so much that you can tap on mentally as well. You could be the supervisor, you just need to know what, what's happening in the space and, and to advise. Um, I think that can happen, uh, and that's what we did. Um, on on employment side, I think I would definitely quote the um, the Microsoft inclusive hiring process, which I think is 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 really really good, and and I think they're the first to do it, where um, they they don't immediately reject um, an applicant with a disability. They say, okay, we'll give you six months go and craft out the ideal work environment within our offices that will allow you to thrive to the best of your abilities. And we have a six months period to, to observe, right? And so it's, it's you know, putting all the power um, and decision-making uh, ability with the person with a disability. And I think that is empowering. Thank you for sharing, Ken. Right, uh, Rosemary, would you have any last thoughts, suggestions that you would like to share? Yes, um, on that on that same topic that you know everyone is touching on, uh, what we do in Guyana here is that we have a government funded agency called the Board of Industrial Training, and what what is what this um, agency does is that it provides training for out of school individuals, because not everybody is cut out for academics. So um, they offer training in technical vocational areas. And what we as a disability community um, have done is that we've reached out to them. And so every year 
we get a part of their budget to do training in tech voc areas for persons with disabilities. So for those who have dropped out of school or did or never had the opportunity to go to school, they receive training in areas like computer repairs, web designing, uh, cosmetology, um, you know, doing like food preservatives and areas where you have a market and where these individuals are able to generate income, not only for themselves, but also to sustain their organization. So maybe that's also something that other NGOs or DPOs could look into in terms of providing employment for persons with disabilities. Thank you, Rosemary. Um, I think so we have uh, Bazira, is it? Yes. Bazira, would you like to share your thoughts with the audience? Yes, um, hello, good evening to all. Uh, yeah, my thoughts. Hello. Does it have been lost you over there? Can you? Yeah, hello. Perfect. We can hear you now. Uh, yes. Uh, see, uh, when I'm talking about job opportunities, uh, we all, uh, it's unique to each one of us. So, um, how should I say? It's like uh, each time you have, uh, you see, you need to revisit uh, with your knowledge. You have to revisit, you have to keep assessing for uh, good qualities. You need to uh, see if you can do something, uh, if you can make changes in your, uh, in your, I uh, in your way, in your, knowledge in your skill building you that could be that could be constructive that sh that uh, that may be constructive so it's always important to keep upgrading uh, and uh, it's uh, we advise everyone to do that and why not it should i mean it should also be to us right so we advise uh, people and uh, so it's common it's common to all we need to always keep upgrading uh, on the knowledge, we need to keep upgrading on the skills. Um, so um, I, I did that. I, I have done the same thing. All this, I mean, I've been doing this all my life. So and uh, I never just uh, keep myself. I never keep. I never hold myself doing this. And uh, I never want bad for anyone. I mean, I never want to just do something which is like. I never want to keep pause. I don't want to just uh, uh, keep pause in my way of knowledge, in my, um, in, um, in procuring things, in knowing things out, in trying to know where I am going wrong. Uh, I don't see that as uh, doing, I mean, I don't see this that good, see that as a good thing. So I think that is very important. I feel Updation, I feel uh, updation should always be there. Updation, upgrading, and updating the knowledge, your previous knowledge, your existing knowledge, and your constructive part, and the constructive uh, side of that piece of knowledge is very important now. I, uh, I feel that that is quite very important because you need to always, I feel that constructing knowledge constructive knowledge is very important right now. Thank you, Bazira, for your thoughts around it. Uh, maybe, Arjun, if you are there, if you could share your final thoughts around uh, employment, because Bazira was talking about it on making more inclusive employment and giving more access to employment for persons with disabilities. Because once again, like you said, it's a business case. How do we bring that validation to it? It's not an easy path. And you you were very strongly saying that it, it should happen, you know, from the top down, then a bottom up approach. Uh, maybe your final thoughts around this with the audience today. Um, um, just from where Brazira, uh, you know, left, I think uh, that is one of the biggest um, you know, asset a person can hold. And uh, that is what differentiates. Uh, so while I have uh, been working with so many people with disabilities, one 
common factor which i would be able to identify is that how they have those who have come up to me have this ability in them so they understand the norm and they understand that they do not want to be a part of uh, leave it, leading a life of dependence and maybe that curiosity um, which basira was trying to refer to uh, is what you know and the idea of leaving leading a life of self dependence and not uh remaining dependent on themselves or you know being not being dependent on their family the society the donors etc is what uh makes them to look for organizations like mine and i think that is something which is you know uh which a person has to have imbibed in himself that is not something which any form of motivation can lead to if a person does not have that uh leave alone my organization nobody in this world can help him so uh, it's it's something which has to be in a person itself as far as uh, the the access to need, to various kind of resources the training which is required you know the companies which could be required i think they are all there there is no such place where you don't have that uh, you know set of resources already you just have to go around searching you will find answers um, if you if you knock the right doors and uh, honestly those are already there there are companies in any part of the world which which if created a use case for i believe um would would respond and would accept to the idea um I, i'm i shouldn't be saying this but i'm a very strong advocate of the idea that profit makes things perfect and eventually if you can you know create uh, all the various issues and i do not say that they are less important may that be about societal discrimination may that be about uh, issues about um, people being discriminated i have actually seen in nabit's story and where i started working from which is uh, uh, away from the city and it's more of a close to a it's though it's, even though it's an industrial town it's close to a village where uh, we had the same set of challenges with you know witchcraft and what not about uh, and how people with disabilities are considered as bad omens and it's not um a, a thing which is specific to any country such as or it's not something to specific to africa even in we had these things here also but it's the same families today who are not only welcoming they are having people with disabilities a part of their homes and uh, what has changed eventually i think is over time it's that uh, they have come to understand that it's just that they are no different that people with disabilities aren't anyways different than them is just that they have had some part of the body which does not function maybe as normally as us and apart from that there's no other difference they have the same sentiments they have the same emotions they respond to the same way like any one of us and and my interaction of working with them also has been around you know using a three pronged approach it's a mix of a lot of love with them so i try to create an atmosphere of uh in the organization where uh you know they know that if it's there is an issue may that be an ex employer or may that be if they are working with me or they are not working with me they know that they can come back to me and they know that i will stand up for them to whatever ability that best can i can do and it's that respect which they have uh which i think has been earned over 10 years and what they understand is that you know um uh if the centric issue of uh you know if it's an inferior kind of work which they have done they know that if they have created an issue which is uh, which is of discriminatory in nature or if then any ways they have used their disability as a ploy to get any unasked benefit which should not have been got to them i will be the last one actually i will not defend i'll be the one who will side with the corporate in that case but if it's a genuine case they know that i enjoy that level of uh, camaraderie with the companies also that i will ensure that they uh, get their just due i think it's a mix of uh, over the years where they have seen incidents and it's that um, years of uh, of respect and love which i have earned which i think is my legacy which i have to carry it's not the work the work was always there uh, the solution could have been developed by anyone else and it can still be developed by anyone else even after i have made those answers there are no rocket science things which i have devised it's this change in perception and which all starts from what wazira wazira right i'm sorry wazira uh, rightly mentioned 
it's that having that innate ability in a person that i want to change my status of life i want to change um the my way of life and i want to change society's perception of mine uh, which leads to everything else along the path thank you arjun i mean definitely you you can put it in a very concise and a beautiful way how anyone would think right now after this conversation i would say i mean i definitely agree with you you cannot have a business without a profit i mean profit ultimately ensures that you sustain and you develop and that has to be a factor of it i think businesses now have actually moved into the uh, triple bottom line where they look at the people the profit and the planet so it's timely and like you said it's happening it's more about how do we open more doors and ensure and make them see the benefits of this beyond someone's disability so with that uh, today's discourse was mainly about uh, how do we accept you know the fact that acquiring a disability is a fact of life than a sad reality because that's what many perceive it to be right and also to understand that we are all temporarily able bodied persons and then having a disability is inevitable so today it was all about what we can do as a community and our panelists and even our audience have shared some wonderful actionable solutions and i keep on saying actionable solutions because i am personally tired of you know policy changes and getting a policy go around the country and being approved and nothing happening so it's it's up to us i mean we can blame the government we can go about the blame game we can blame so many people but it's also about how do we understand the reality and how do we as a community do something about it and it's not just about a specific group it's about all of us it's our survival it's our sustenance so it's important we have these type of conversations every day so i hope all of you did enjoy this thoroughly as i did with this amazing panelists and our audience and we hope you would take at least one step forward than you did yesterday to ensure that this society our communities the commonwealth together is more inclusive and we leave no one behind and a very special thank you to the commonwealth youth program and the commonwealth secretariat uh, please follow their pages to see some wonderful program outlines with the commonwealth action series over the next few months as well and also a special mention to the commonwealth children and youth disability network please log in to www.includemetoo.org.uk to see how you could be a part of this network uh, it's amazing we are a part of it as well and i can guarantee you there are so many opportunities to network and to co-create more uh, solutions and more discussions around things and to learn and to even wonder and also lastly but definitely not least the global shapers community who are one of our sub partners today and also the global shapers colombo hub because they are planning a, a summit in december third of december fifth of december in tandem with the international day for persons with disabilities uh, which is for the shaping disability summit please follow their facebook pages and see how you would like to get involved with this summit as well with that it is a wrap from us uh, it, it is a wrap from all of us here today So have a good rest of the day and stay safe. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Uh, pleasure meeting everyone. Look forward to meet you all soon. Take care. Yeah, Bye. Yeah. Nice meeting you. We'll catch up over text. Arjun is really okay. nice to see you. Again. Same pleasure, likewise. Thank Bye. You. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.